Hello future viewers! Today we are looking at a type of game which is not usually on my channel. This is a game for the original Game Boy. Not, as you may surmise, already being played on an original Game Boy, but still. Lunar Chase. This is a game that was not intended to be released at all. Oh, they made it! But then they decided that is, certain people at Nintendo decided that it was too complicated for a Western audience and never released. This is, of course, according to Internet Rumor, the most reliable source of information available to mankind. But anyway, um, they say Earth is too overcrowded to be inhabitable, which is a little bit odd to me, but I get what they're trying to say. Earth is, um, Earth is having problems and they need to move. And if the size of those planets is actually to scale, then yeah, I guess that'll at least solve the problem for a little while. Anyway, we, as you may have observed here, this is a polygon game. Now, the original Game Boy, there's a pretty decent chance that people who are watching this channel have not actually used an original Game Boy before. This was a system that came out back when the regular 8-bit Nintendo was state-of-the-art. The Game Boy, as you can see, has... Um, it, it's, it's monochrome. It has different shades of white and black. And by white, I mean that kind of yellowish screen that the Game Boy used to have. This is not that color, but never mind. I think you get the general idea. Look at the limitations of the NES sometime. They're pretty, um, interesting, and I'm fairly sure that the Game Boy has more limitations than that because of hardware restrictions. The Game Boy was certainly not known for its ability to handle polygon graphics. I mean, the 16-bit NES, much more powerful, still only barely handled polygon graphics. Now. This is not to say that they were unheard of before this. I, I recall several old computer games that used polygons in this way. The one that I personally played was called Spectre, and it was a tank game. Um, they seem to enjoy polygon graphics for tank games. And this, this game, Lunar Chase, is no exception. Still, using the original Game Boy for polygons is a very, very bold move. I, I have to salute the guts of the team who decided that this could work. So how do they have a polygon engine and also a decent frame rate in this game when there's several objects on screen? The answer is simple. They don't. They just kind of uh, worked to make the gameplay easy enough to deal with that you can still function under those conditions. And we're going to see those conditions. You can look forward to that. By the way, the, the, the instructions this game gives you for an encounter with an enemy tank here, they seem tailored designed to get you killed. For example, not moving at all in the presence of an enemy is not a great idea. Decreasing your speed to turn more sharply is a good idea, certainly. Stopping right in front of an active enemy, not so much. And they tell you to stop twice, that's interesting. A mushroom to recover your health. Um, they did throw in some little nods to Nintendo during the making of this game, which is fine by me, I think. I can live with this. If you're really sharp, you can even find a coin block at some point. At least, I was able to. There might be more than one, and I simply did not find them. But anyway... And yeah, the game kind of gave away that we're dealing with aliens, it's not a huge secret. You can shoot power-ups to turn them into different power-ups. There are limits to this. For example, uh, fuel power-ups will not transform. Thank you. 
I, I appreciate this design. Having a sort of guidepost for vehicles to easily dock with a building seems... I don't know if realistic is quite the right word, but it, it is certainly a thing that makes sense. Like, it is something that I can easily believe people would do. And especially with older video games, um, y you take those things where you can get them. Also, it would make sense that docking only worked when you were at low speed, but actually it's fine even at medium speed and probably high. I, I haven't tried docking at maximum speed a whole lot. But this tutorial overall really emphasizes moving slow. By the way, you can't leave this building until all the radio link hints have played. Now uh, about those equip items to the right. The lock-on is the sort of thing that you use most of the time and the other three are much more specialized. And I do mean specialized, not um, not powerful exactly. You, there's very specific situations that you want to use most of those. Let's talk about missiles. They are um, a fairly important part of this game, as is the lock-on item. As I said, that's the one you're going to be equipped with most of the time. It's useful for more than just firing missiles as well. And as for finding the enemy, you, you just have to get some distance away from the base and it'll show up in this tutorial. I believe that most enemies just kind of spawn nearby while you're traveling in this game. They're kind of random encounter hazards, except for mission important enemies, which you have to uh, actively chase or look around for. And yes, this game uses throttle controls for your speed, which, since you're in a tank, makes a decent amount of sense. It makes less sense in Mech Warrior games, but don't get me started about that. Now, there's something that you might infer from these descriptions that is actually not true. By the way, locking onto an enemy allows you to circle strafe it, which is um, fairly important for enemies that can shoot at you. There are some of those. And hooray! You need the lock-on item to lock on and fire a missile, but do not be fooled. Those are not guided missiles. They fire straight ahead. They are more like rockets. And yes, you have to uh, keep track of your ammo stock. Th these missiles, they are definitely tools of necessity rather than convenience. Because of their uh, fairly slow movement speed and your limited stock and the requirement of a lock-on as compared to your hit scan unlimited ammo laser, um, you definitely want to use missiles only on targets that require missiles. And yep, you have several support networks in this game. The bases, at, like you just saw, being one, and the other being this tunnel system. They, uh, the people on your side have actually gone through a great deal of trouble to provide uh, support for your tank, which is pretty nice. Boom. Thankfully, bumping into this doesn't cause any damage. But it does cost time, and time is going to be at a premium in a lot of missions in this game. Also, speaking of which, tunnel travel. It is effectively instantaneous. You'll see it in just a little bit, but tunnel travel does not consume any in-game time. And it has the best fast travel music I've ever heard. Like, I, I don't quite know how they pulled it off, but... They, they pu actually put some decent soundtracks in this Game Boy game. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, um, 
imagining the tank pilot just kind of uh, nodding his or her head while playing this this tunnel music. I'd love to see an animation of that at some point. Also, aside from the fast travel, you get full resupply of something when you go through the junction. And this is a big deal. Missiles especially. Um, you can only usually get missiles uh, one at a time, either from supply bases or from enemies. And this can be um, pretty cumbersome. Getting a full restock as a side benefit of fast travel is a really big deal. Especially because your missile count carries over from one mission to the next. But, of course, those are all much less important than the really nice music. Anyway. This, this map is actually pretty important too. You'll have to, during the missions, go to specific areas to find various important things or defend um, particular items as well. By items I mean usually some sort of uh, important fortification or building or... Anyway, flying. Yeah, you can fly in this game. Just go really fast at a pyramid and you're flying now. Instead of controlling your speed, up and down now controls your altitude, you can turn left and right as normal, and you can shoot things that are in the air. Strafing ground targets is actually um, not really recommended. It's better to just land and deal with them. And yes, as the game points out, your fuel is only really consumed when flying or going at turbo speed, but mostly while flying. Going at even high speed does not consume enough fuel to be noticeable at all. And it's, I think that's pretty nice. I, I appreciate that the game doesn't strand you, usually. Also, I, although flying through hoops is not my favorite thing in games, I will usually accept them during some sort of in-setting uh, training sequence. And especially in this game because the, uh, the flying controls feel uh, a little bit sluggish and it takes some work to get used to them. You are not um, a high-performance dogfighter. You, you are basically a hover tank with very, um, how shall I say, I would almost say improvised flying capacity if there weren't inbuilt tools for it. Anyway, flying is, as I said, good for fighting flying enemies and also for fast travel if tunnels are not readily available. And you're gonna need some fast travel. Now this tutorial took a while, and I think that's fair, especially for a um, an 8-bit Game Boy game. There's a fair number of game features that are important to know about. Also, this particular tunnel of music only happens tw twice in the entire game, so savor it. That's rude. Just closing the door on me like that when they apparently am on my side and know that I was going through. Yeesh. Also, this introduction of our commander right here kind of gives me the idea that they introduced the training part later in the development and this was supposed to be the very first time we see this guy. Okay, I, I, I'll, this is another thing I appreciate about these mission briefings. They, they show what important things look like before they throw you onto the battlefield. 
That is very considerate of them, and I kind of wish more games did that. Oh, okay. This thing is not entirely stable, then. We've already been introduced to those, but there's eight of them in the world, and they're fairly close to each other. It's not difficult to travel to any one of them if you need some extra supplies, or to switch your special item type. Of, of, the, of these four, the only types we'll, we could possibly use more than once are the lock-on, which I talked about, and also the jetpack, which lets you take off into the air at any point instead of relying on pyramids. That can also be useful sometimes. The other two, you use them when the game tells you to, and that's about it. There are good reasons for that as well. The game frequently refers you to which area an important thing is in. So it can be helpful to memorize that sort of thing. It's not all that difficult. Anyway, uh, since the tunnel is closer than uh, traveling to the objective just on the ground, we'll just do this. Now, we don't technically need to transform the power-up right now, but just to keep good habits. And the reason that we don't need to transform it right now is that uh, I plan to fully restock on missiles in just a minute. You see how the clock at the top is frozen while I'm in a tunnel? Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said instantaneous travel. Now, there's this particular mission gives you so much time that you can very easily just travel the long way without any problems, but it's good to get into the habit of using these kinds of features. Now, granted I wouldn't do it in a speedrun because tunnels take a decent amount of real life time, but still. Are there any speedruns of this game? I, I might actually be interested in seeing something like that, and what tricks people might pull off to get those coveted uh, short wins. Also, the tunnel junction does uh, run out of supplies when you get one restock. However, you, it gets restored before every mission. So, so use it whenever you need it. The same goes for the supply bases all over the place. Yes, you can only restock a particular item from them once, but they get restocked between missions as well. And here we are. Now the arrow for important mission items is a little bit unreliable. Also, these, these spider things are a little bit of a mystery to me. They walk around, they don't seem to attack, and they're uh, difficult to kill, so I assume they drop something nice if you manage to get them. Anyway, the, the quest arrow is good for getting into the general vicinity of a mission item. But you should still try to use your radar to locate it more precisely. The music you're listening to now is basically the encounter music. Oh, an important thing to remember about the map is that being a, well, basically a planet, it is round and you can wrap around like this. Very, very important to know that to save time. 
Also, the, the map in this game is fairly large for such an old game. Uh, traveling from one side to the other, for example, roughly uh, halfway across the map, that takes a fair amount of time. So, th that's uh, something to bear in mind, um, and use whatever you can to travel quickly. That's a big part of this game. Anyway, this, w this mission was fairly simple. Just find something in one place and go to the other place to deliver it, and maybe fight one or two enemies. That's just basically getting you accustomed to the layout of the place and how tunnels work and such before things get really serious. And, and things are going to get really serious. Do not you worry about that. Anyway, that's the end of the first uh, video. I thought the tutorial and the first mission would be a fair demonstration of the basics. We're going to take on some more missions next time. Later!